Jeremiah felt ill-prepared for this ministry. This reminds us of what Bart was saying uh, as we looked at it last week, how the Word of God comes from outside of us, outside of our heart. It's not something that we develop and we think through and imagine. It's not our reflection of our experience of God, however we may uh, uh, conceive of it, but rather it is something where God Himself comes from outside our experience, outside our world, and addresses us. And we receive that word, whether we like the word or not. This is God's word to you. And now you are responsible to proclaim that word. And that was Jeremiah's situation. God would come to him, reveal his word, and give him a word which was not very palatable. It was not the peace and prosperity message that most folks wanted to listen to. But a message of judgment, of wrath. A call to repentance, change. It's not a message that Jeremiah necessarily wanted to proclaim. And what is more, when you look at his ministry, you find that his message constantly went against the prevailing point of view, constantly brought him into conflict with those who were in authority in Jerusalem, and constantly brought trouble into his life. It would have been much easier to abandon this message. And present something much more help. Jeremiah would not do it. Because it was the word of God that he was called upon to proclaim. Now, with such an unpopular message, you can understand in part not only where Jeremiah says, I'm but a child, and so I'm not eloquent of expression, I'm not rhetorically skilled, and so I'm unworthy to bring such a message, but also Jeremiah, but Jeremiah might be thinking, I'm a rather sensitive man. I am a, a quiet person. I'm not a bold, strong, courageous person. So how am I going to take this message, which nobody's going to like, and bring it right before the kings and the priests and, and, and the people of the day? I don't have the personal wherewithal to proclaim this message. How often do you feel like that? When you have a tough word to say to somebody and you don't feel like you really have the strength to say it. It's hard. And so we see something of, of the very humanity of Jeremiah. Not eloquent. Not forceful. Not bold. And yet called upon to present a powerful message that would conflict with the general feelings of his day. This was the incarnation of the Word of God in Jeremiah's life. Taking into account his historic circumstances, his personal character and well-being, and the specific mission that God had called for him. All of this comes down to the point where the, the opening words of this book are, these are the words of Jeremiah. So we see the very humanity of the book put right before us. But at the same time, I think it's in the fourth verse we see, the Word of God says, both side by side, the words of Jeremiah, and yet the Word of God speaking. And that is how God presents His Word to us. God speaks, but He uses the Jeremiah's, the Isaiah's, Malachi's and the Matthews to address us so that we can hear, so that we can understand and see what God is saying. I like the fact that here in Jeremiah, the first chapter, God, as it were, tests his servant at the start. Just checks him out, makes sure he, he's working functionally properly before he sends him out onto his mission. <laughs> he says, first of all, I think it's in the 11th verse, what do you see, Jeremiah? You know, we're going to check your, your vision here and see if you can see what I'm seeing here. There's a branch from an almond tree. What do you see? And Jeremiah responds, Okay, Jeremiah, that's what you see. I am going to fulfill my word. You see what the Lord is doing here? He's giving Jeremiah very simple entry lessons into receiving God's word. Training him and preparing for him for his ministry. Testing him and making sure that he knows what he's doing. When God calls you into his ministry, whether it be 
as a father, a mother, as a Sunday school teacher, as an elder, or as a pastor, God equips you, trains you, and helps you to do that which you are called to do. And He may put you through some very elementary lessons to get started, but there will be deeper lessons as you go along. So after the first vision, and Jeremiah's vision checked out all right, he goes on to the second vision of the boiling pot. And that's where we get into some deeper stuff. This is what would, if you will, would get Jeremiah into hot water. <laughs> because this was a very difficult message, a message of judgment. But the very humanity of Jeremiah is presented to us. And it is in no way an obstacle to the word of God. One of the things that ensures us that the words of Jeremiah are the word of the Lord is how God speaks of predestination here. I knew you before you were born. I knew you from eternity past. I formed you for this very purpose. And then at the end, God says that He will make him strong so that he'll be uh, like, like his forehead will be burnished bronze and so forth. God will has formed him from eternity past and reminds us that God is sovereign over history. He orders all of history to accomplish his purposes. So he promises certain things in time and he accomplishes them. He is the all-powerful sovereign God who works through the evils of this world. The rise of the Babylonians, the slaughter, the mayhem, the death and destruction that they brought throughout the world that day, God worked through that to accomplish His righteous and just purposes. And if God could arrange all of the events of history for His own purpose, and certainly by His predestinating power, He could arrange Jeremiah and his secretary Baruch as they transcribed and wrote the Word of God and make sure that everything they spoke was what God intended. God's very Word. God's predestination assures us that Je Jeremiah's message is true and can be trusted. And the same can be said with the rest of Scripture. But all this is the incarnation of the Word. God's Word becoming flesh. Some commentators have noted these stark uh, or striking similarities between Jeremiah and Jesus. Strong connections between the two, both announcing a message of judgment, both advancing the notion that Jerusalem would be destroyed, both weeping over what would occur in Jerusalem, uh, both being rather sensitive of nature and yet uh, very eloquent in their speech, making use of a wide variety of images to impress upon God's people God's word. Jeremiah and Jesus, in many respects, are very much alike. But most especially in this way, in the incarnation of the Word. God's Word comes to us in human form. Now, some object and say that that is a problem. And we'll get into that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But it shouldn't be a problem. I was reading the autobiography of uh, Martin Luther King, Jr., in which he speaks of his upbringing, where he grew up in a fundamentalist Baptist church, which in the black culture many times was uh, filled with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of emotion and joy and, and experience, but was rather light in theology and understanding of the scriptures. And Martin Luther King was a a careful student, and he became aware of the higher criticism of the scriptures, and he didn't feel like his fundamentalist background had answers to the questions that the, or the criticisms that the higher critics were bringing against the scriptures. And so the humanity of his experience, the culture in which he was brought up, the lack of answers that he found caused him to move in the direction of a neo-orthodox understanding of the scriptures and of God's message, and of course into a, a nonviolent protest uh, of civil rights issues. 
but the humanity of his background, his experience, was a little bit too intense for him. In some respects, he had to back away from his upbringing. But then when you read some of his sermons, he talks about the importance of entering into the world, of getting your hands involved, of being a good Samaritan, and reaching out and helping someone. He understood that the word cannot just simply be a notion out there, but it has to take flesh in our actions and our behaviors. The word becoming flesh. We who understand that word and have answers for many of these criticisms of the scriptures, which we'll get into the word going next time, we should be the word made flesh as well. That word should become a part of our lives. Paul describes the early Christians as uh, having God's word written on their hearts. They were living letters at work in the world today. We should be something of that as well. Living God's word, incarnating it in everyday life. And so, making it not just simply an airy story, abstracted from time, but entering into our personal experience. Have you experienced God's word for yourself? Have you been moved by his message of salvation? Have you come to trust in Jesus, of whom the scriptures speak, and rest in him alone? It's only by his power that you can be transformed and live a new life by the power of God and incarnate the word of God. Let the word become flesh in your life. Father, we thank you for your word and for the way that it speaks to us in ways that we can hear and understand. We thank you that you have stooped to our level and placed before us men of flesh and blood, men of uh, passions and men of uh, conflict and challenge, uh, so that we might see from their experience how you work in the hearts and lives of your people. And we pray that your word would sink deeply into our hearts and our lives that we would respond to it, trusting in your promises, uh, heeding your warnings, and walking in the paths of your spirit. We ask for your blessing on us. In Jesus' name, amen.